got a secret. Can you? I know you want to kiss me. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mike's Mike. My name is Factually, Contractually, and Legally. Mike, you might have a few questions. First question is, where have you been for the last two and a half weeks? Here's where I've been, doing very important work. Follow up question, what is this? Well, you will soon find out. Also, I should never have bought this. It's giving me too much power. The person who has the stick gets to talk. And since I have the stick, no more talking for the rest of the video. Pay attention. Before we get started, I just wanted to say that um, an obscene amount of work went into this video. So mm, if you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a like, leave me a comment and share it around, babe. I am extremely excited about this video. I feel like my entire existence on the internet has led to this point. In this video series, we will be doing the deepest possible dive into the plot and characters of the television show Pretty Little Liars. Why would I do this? For a few reasons. First reason is because I want to. Pretty Little Liars is part of my personality. And if I'm showing myself online, that sounds weird. If I'm showing myself online in terms of what I enjoy, this is what I enjoy. Now, reason number two is because you're ready for it. A few weeks ago, I watched Jenny Nicholson's video on the Vampire Diaries, which was like two hours long, and it was absolutely fantastic. So if you've not seen it, I highly recommend going to watch that. Now, Jenny's video is a little bit different to this one because I'm going to be focusing exclusively on the plot and characters and a little bit of exposition, whereas her video was a lot of detail about the show itself, Vampire Diaries. Hers is way more professional than mine. <laughs> I think Mine might be unhinged. Like as I was doing this and I was spending like ridiculous amounts of hours on this and I was not getting bored, I was like, I think something's wrong. But yes, after watching Jenny's video, I realized that maybe people are ready for these like multiple hour deep dives into 2010s TV shows. And how could I not talk about Pretty Little Liars? I have a theory that you know how everyone talks about Scream like it's one of the most iconic pop culture movies when at the time it wasn't like super critically acclaimed i think pretty little lies is going to be the same in a couple of years people are going to watch this show and be like this is ridiculously iconic even though it's not fantastic but it is fantastic and you'll understand why but yes big shout out to jenny nicholson without that vampire diaries video this probably wouldn't exist so maybe okay so this is how it's going to work we're going to go through pretty little liars seasons one to seven going to the plot and character details for each season, all 160 episodes from all seven seasons. And each season is assigned a color of string. And the string color designates relationships and plot interactions between the characters. So in this video, we're gonna cover season one, which is red, which is already put up on the wall, season two, which will be in green, and season three, which is in blue. Now we're doing all of season one, all of season two and the first half of season three, which in total is 60 episodes. Then for part two, I'm planning on finishing season three, doing season four and season five. And then the final part will be season six and season seven. The reason for dividing the show like that is because in my professional opinion and the professional opinion of my expert advisor, Jacob, who has watched this like 17,000 times, we feel like that's how the plot is rounded up well. If you really think about it, this is actually extremely iconic. This is my art pop era. Eh. Uh, my art pop could mean anything and it means this. Just a quick note on the number of episodes in this show. So there's 160 episodes across the seven seasons. I strongly believe this show would have benefited from having maybe 10 or 12 episodes per season. The overall plot is fantastic. And I think they did overall a pretty good job of like tying up all the loose ends and making it really interesting. This was a fantastic TV show, let's just be real, okay? It's ridiculous, sometimes it's problematic, but overall it's a fantastic TV show. But there are way too many episodes. Just look at this, right? This is the interactions that I deemed important. There are so many more interactions and plot lines. <gasps> what happened here? We've had a casualty. Slide your way on over. But yes, these are just the plot lines and interactions that I deemed as important to the overall plot. Right? There are so many other ones that I will not be covering that are just filler. I would say in every 25 episode season, seven or eight episodes could be gone and it wouldn't even matter. But then sometimes you'll be watching an episode and absolutely nothing is happening and they'll drop a major plot line, such as season two, episode 20, but we'll get to that. So I'd say this show would have benefited from having 12 episode seasons, but I understand that when this came out, 2010 to 2017, that that was the golden age of weekly TV, right? Perhaps it wasn't meant to be binged like I have been, like 10 episodes a day, because it's exhausting. And let me tell you, I am not playing when I say that this show has potentially the most convoluted plot on any TV show that I've seen. Viewer exhaustion aside, this is definitely one of my favorite TV shows. I absolutely love it. And hopefully by the end of this video series, you understand why, and you might feel the same way. That doesn't excuse 
the show from being ridiculous and problematic. And if I say things like, Marlene, you're not seeing heaven, <laughs> it's a joke. Some of the shit in this show is just absolutely not it, babe. But overall, Marlene, that's my bestie. Another interesting thing about this show is when I think about similar shows with convoluted plot lines, you know, Game of Thrones, Lost, they had similar issues in a sense that there are so many open plot lines towards the end of the show that there's absolutely no way that they could cover all bases and everyone just absolutely hated the ending. And speaking of, if this video series does well, I'm considering doing more shows. I'd love to do Lost, but that one is a beast as well. And maybe Dark, Gossip Girl, Glee, there's so many. But yes, the series finale of Pretty Little Liars has the lowest score. <laughs> than any episode in the entire series. And there are some bad episodes. And you'll soon understand that, you know, the last season and the last episode, if you just look at them at face value, it's fun TV. It's good to watch. But then if you watch the entire show and you see how many plot lines are left open, how many red herrings and just like things they missed and just don't make sense, you'll soon understand why that has the lowest rating in the entire series. To be honest, it sort of feels like they were writing the show not knowing how many seasons there were going to be, which is actually possible because ABC Family, which is now called Freeform, ugly name, ill. ABC Family would renew the series on a season by season basis, except for season six and seven, which they announced at the same time. And I also read a bunch of interviews with Marlene and also a bunch of the actors from the show that apparently it was supposed to end after season six and then they tacked on season seven, so they had to change the whole plot. And also Marlene had a different idea for the final baddie being someone else. We'll talk about that later. No spoilers, babe. That's another point. This entire video series, the plan is, if you have seen the show, you will know who I'm talking about when I refer to this question marked person or the one that comes after, or the one that comes after. But if you haven't seen the show, hopefully you'll understand everything that you need to know. Therefore, you don't need to watch all 160 episodes unless you want to. I'm doing you a public service, slay. In terms of creators and source material, the show was developed by I, Marlene King. Now this girl boss will be henceforth referred to as Marlene. And the show was loosely based on the series of books written by Sarah Shepard. After doing some research, it seems that, oh, that looks like, you know, in Harry Potter when they pull the memories out with the wand. <gasps> this is me pulling my memories from my research. It would seem that the show was very similar to the books at the start, season one and season two, and then it just kind of splits and maybe that's when they lost their way. For example, I've read that the show writers changed a bunch of the source material so they could preserve their ships. If you're not familiar with what ships are, babe, just Google it. Just type in ships urban dictionary and you'll get it. A ship is basically a relationship between two characters that the fans enjoy. More on preserving the ships later, <coughs> Ezra Fitz, felon, 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 jail, Prison. Let's talk about some actual examples of differences between the books and the TV show. Um, if you are not familiar with the characters that I'm about to talk about, then just ignore it. And then when I talk about the series, you'll understand. For example, a difference is Caleb Rivers doesn't exist in the book series. Marlene loves to use Caleb to fix a plot hole, which we will soon find out. Also, Ezra Fitz, felon of the century, goes to jail. And he's only like a couple of chapters of the first book. And honestly, I wish that had happened. This man is crusty. I'm gonna tear him a new one. Mona snaps her neck and dies. Toby dies. Jenna is murdered. Sarah Harvey never exists. Arya dates Noel for most of the series. Also, get this, right? Allison kills a bunch of people. Okay, so to start our season one plot deep dive, I'm going to read you the description from the Pretty Little Lies IMDb page so you can feel like you're hearing about this show for the first time in 2010 and you're about to watch it. Set in the fictional town of Rosewood, Pennsylvania, the series follows the lives of five girls, Aria Montgomery, Hannah Marin, Spencer Hastings, Emily Fields, and Alison De Laurentiis, whose clique falls apart after Alison, the leader of the group, disappears. One year later, the remaining four friends are reunited as they begin receiving messages from a mysterious figure named A, who threatens to expose their deepest secrets, including ones they thought only Allison knew. What a concept. What, Sarah Shepard, that's my bestie right there. Like, she deserves every award that there is. Now, why isn't Sarah Shepard in the billionaire class? So season one, episode one, the pilot, June 2010. The very first scenes of this show are about the most important event of the entire series the night when Alison disappeared. We see the main characters, I'm gonna list them again so you know who I'm talking about and who I'm pointing to. Aria Montgomery, Hannah Marin, 
Alison De Laurentiis, Spencer Hastings, and Emily Fields. They're having a sleepover at Spencer's Barn. Now I've put this like timeline up here. I think you can, that is in frame, right? Yeah, it says the day Alison disappeared. And then I've got a sticky note here called The Barn. As we get more details about this, I'm gonna put more sticky notes up. So this is where we're starting. The episode starts with Menace of the Millennium, Alison De Laurentiis. She is truly the menace of the millennium. Oof. More on that later. She plays a prank on the girls and they're all like, ha ha ha, let me sip this drink. Now, Alison has so graciously provided drinks that may or may not be important later. The girls go to sleep and then later on, one by one, they start waking up. So we have Aria, Hannah and Emily waking up, but Spencer's not there and neither is Alison. Spencer comes back into the barn and says, Alison is missing and I think I heard a scream. Now that's the end of the first flashback sequence. Jump to present day which is one year later. We're being introduced to the four living characters who are 16 at this point. Arya Montgomery has returned to Rosewood from Iceland because her father, Byron Montgomery, had a sabbatical there, babes. Now, keywords that I've written down for Arya in season one are cool, edgy, and stylish. She also had a streak of pink hair. Maybe she debuted before Itzy, I don't know. She gets home to Rosewood and she's unpacking boxes with her mother, Ella Montgomery, and then she takes her brother, Mike Montgomery to, I think, lacrosse practice. Who plays lacrosse? That's not like I'm shaming people who play lacrosse. I just don't know anyone that plays lacrosse. After dropping Mike off, she goes to a bar because she's so slay and edgy and girl boss. She's 16, remember. At the bar, she sees a poster for Alison's disappearance. At this point, the body has not been found. Happens at the end of the episode. In the bar, she meets Ezra Fitz, the crust lord of the millennium. He introduces himself as Ezra and he's a 23 year old graduate from Hollis College, which is like the university closest to Rosewood. I don't actually know if it's in Rosewood. I think it's just Rosewood adjacent. The two talk and he mentions how he's a teacher and Arya's like, okay, Slay, I wanna be a teacher. I love English, I wanna be an English teacher. So Arya introduces herself as a student and he says he's a teacher, but he doesn't say where he's teaching and she doesn't say where she's a student. They get really close after talking about their mutual love for English and they end up hooking up in the bathroom. It's implied that he doesn't know what her age is. This is the first of many many weird older man younger woman relationships in this TV show. There are just so many. I mean, feel free to count on your fingers how many felons we come across as we go through the show and you will run out of fingers, bestie. The next main character that we meet is Hannah Marin. Now the key words for Hannah Marin in season one are fashionable, loyal, and blonde, because being blonde is apparently a personality trait in 2000s and 2010s TV shows. She's shopping with her bestie, Mona Vanderwall. Now these girls, they love a five finger discount, right? They love to steal. When they introduce, they are stealing. Hannah steals a pair of sunglasses. It is now the first day of school and Byron drops Aria off at school and he hints towards a mistake that he made. And he says, I made a mistake, it'll never happen again. Aria has a flashback to when she and Allison were ditching Mona. So they were basically bullies to Mona and Mona wanted to catch out them and they were like, no bitch, get away. And they're running away from Mona and they see a car that has her dad hooking up with Meredith Sorensen, who will become more important later, season three. So straight off the bat, we're already getting secrets. Byron Montgomery cheated on Ella Montgomery with Meredith and Aria and Allison saw it while running away from Mona. At school, Aria catches up with our next main character, Emily Fields who informs her that after Alison disappeared and Arya went to Iceland, the rest of the main characters split up. Emily also says that Hannah and Mona, who used to be at the bottom of the food chain in terms of popularity, had a glow up over the summer and now they're two of the most popular girls in the school. Gorgeous, gorgeous girls love soup. Also the key words for Emily in season one are stressed, sporty, and strong. Arya walks into her English class and discovers that Ezra Fitz is her English teacher. Dun, dun, dun. Now at this point, Arya gets a text, an anonymous text from someone, and it says, maybe he falls around with students all of the time. A lot of teachers do, just ask your dad. And it's signed as dash A. Now this is A. A is sending the girls. It starts off as anonymous texts and threats. It gets a lot worse very quickly. After school, Arya talks to Ezra and he is mad at her because he acts like she led him on. <coughs> Liar. <coughs> felon and he says he doesn't want to have a relationship with her but then she convinces him the next scene we have emily talking to her mother pam fields so here we have 
Pam Fields and Wayne Fields, who are her mum and dad. Now, Wayne only gets a small photo card because he is just not relevant. <laughs> like, sorry to this man, you just do not have the same impact that Pam Fields has. All the big card characters have some impact on the plot. To be honest, Mr. Kenneth here should have had a small card but it would have messed up the symmetry, so I just didn't do it, babe. So yes, Emily's talking to her mother, Pam Fields, who tells her to take a gift basket over to the St. Germains, who are living in Allison's old house. So after Allison disappeared, the parents were there for a while, and then after there were no updates on her disappearance, they decided to move away from Rosewood small town vibes. So Emily goes over to the St. Germain house, and we meet Maya. This character deserved more. Now this show loves the burial gaze trope. Anyway, Maya kisses Emily. Call the Yas police. And Emily's sort of taken aback like, whoa, babe, we literally just met and you're already kissing me on the cheek, babe. What? The next day at school, Emily gets a letter from A in her locker and it reads, hey Em, I've been replaced. You found another friend to kiss. Implies that Emily and Allison have some history. Remember, season 1A is texting pretending to be Allison. It is now time to talk about our fourth and last living girl boss, Spencer Hastings. Spencer Hastings is talking to her absolute galactic threat level menace of a sister, Melissa Hastings. Now let me be real with you for a quick second. Melissa Hastings, Jenna Marshall, Mona Vanderwall, they're some of my favorite characters and they're the messiest. Bitch, these characters are so fucking messy. And this girl boss right here, Melissa Hastings, she's potentially the messiest. So yes, Spencer is talking to her sister, Melissa, and Melissa's fiance, Ren Kingston. I think Melissa is the same age as Ezra. There's kind of two sets of ages. There's like the 16 year olds and then there's the 23, 24 year olds. So in the 23, 24 year old bracket, we've got Melissa, Ian, Garrett, Jason, Ren, Ezra, and some of the other girl bosses that we'll come across later on. So the key words for Spencer in season one are smart, nosy, and rich. Now a quick note on the fashion of season one. In the trenches, absolutely fighting for our lives. Okay, I get that maybe because it was season one and it was just the pilot and they weren't sure if it was gonna get picked up. They gave the girls the crustiest clothes possible. Spencer dresses like she is Hillary Clinton 50 years ago. Put the blazers down. We also have Aria Montgomery. She wears the edgiest shit. And then Allison, I guess season one Allison, you know, it's all just flashbacks from that one summer. She's always wearing like a yellow top. This may as well be called the day Allison wore a yellow top. The amount of scenes that Sasha, the actress, had to wear a yellow top. I know she was screaming and crying. So that let me wear one other item of clothing, Marlene. <laughs> anyway, back to where we were. So Spencer's talking to Melissa and Melissa's like, great job renovating the barn, Spencer. We're gonna move in. And Spencer's like, what the fuck? I just spent my entire summer renovating this barn and then my crusty sister's gonna move in. So we automatically know that R Melissa's the bitch. That's how Melissa is introduced. She's rich bitch slay. <laughs> Later on, Spencer sees Ren smoking some cigarettes, babe. Now Ren, he is two words. He is British and doctor. They're his two key personality traits at this point. He's British, right? He's like, Spencer, Spencer, you didn't see me smoking, did you, babe? So these two are all flirty, okay? And then Spencer gets a text from A hinting that she's jealous of Melissa dating Ren. Paul Spencer always wants Melissa's boyfriend, but remember, if you kiss, I tell. We find out from flashbacks that Spencer has a bit of history with Melissa's boyfriend. So a couple of years ago, Melissa was dating Ian and Spencer hooked up with Ian. All the men in season one of Pretty Little Liars, the Rosewood men, crusty beyond belief. So she hooked up with Ian and Ali knew about it and held it over her and tried to get her to confess the affair to Melissa, but Spencer threatens to expose Ali's involvement in the Jenna thing if she continues to berate her for it. So the Jenna thing, is important. We'll get to that shortly, but first of all, I'm not done just ripping this man to shreds. He's felon number two. So my research says that in the present day timeline, he's 25, which means he hooked up with Spencer when he was 23 and she was 14. When Spencer gets this text, she's like, what the hell is this shit? And she looks out the window and she sees a blonde girl in the window of the former De Laurentiis house. So the Hastings and De Laurentiis households were next to each other. So Spencer sees this figure in the window that looks like Allison. She's like, <gasps> Allison. We never find out if it's Allison. Also, don't worry, not every episode's gonna have this in-depth plot analysis. It's because of the pilot and we get so many characters introduced at the one time. Now, I remember when Hannah stole the sunglasses when she was on her girl boss stealing spree with Mona Vanderwall. So Hannah's at home with her mother, Ashley Marin. Her mother is single because she was married to Tom. They got a divorce and Tom has some other shit going on, which we'll learn about soon. Unfortunately, I hate that plot line. Oh my God. So Hannah and Ashley are at home and they get visited by the police, namely Darren Wilden. 
another crusty. She gets taken to the precinct where she's about to be questioned and she sees like a bowl of lollies and she's like, mm, delicious, let me take one to calm my nerves. And then she gets a text from A taunting her hefty Hannah days. God, hefty Hannah, <laughs> we'll get into that. A text from A says, be careful Hannah, I hear prison food makes you fat. So Hannah's mother Ashley gets Hannah off the charges by being flirty and later sleeping with Darren Wilden, this galactic threat level menace, similar to Melissa, that level of threat of menace, menacity, menacization. And that truly feels like such an extra plot point that Ashley sleeps with Wilden so that Hannah doesn't get charged for stealing sunglasses. And the justification that Ashley gives Hannah is like, reputation matters in a small town. Like it's all over a pair of sunglasses by that night. There are police cars at Maya's house. Now remember Maya is living in the house that Allison used to live in. And Maya's like, they found Allison. And Emily's like, eh, they found my bestie. Eh. And then Maya's like, well actually they found Allison's body. Yes, that is correct. The police found the body of Alison De Laurentiis in the backyard of the De Laurentiis house. I don't even know how to explain to you the level of flop that the Rosewood Police Department is. It's confirmed to be Alison's body. Mm. Okay, I printed these handy X's to indicate when someone has died. She's also died. Okay, so since Alison De Swag Rentis, her body has been found there is a now a funeral. Remember, we're still in the pilot, babes. Still in the pilot. <laughs> At the funeral, there are a bunch of characters and it's actually quite funny because a lot of the characters end up changing actors between the pilot and the next episode. At the funeral, our four girl bosses tell each other that they're getting anonymous threats and texts and letters and all that kind of stuff. So now they each know that they're going through the same thing. Now, at the same time, we have Jenna Marshall turning up to the funeral of Alison De Laurentiis with Toby Kavanagh. Now, Jenna Marshall, she ate these girls up in every scene. The implied threat level of Jenna Marshall, this blind girl, is extremely high. And what an introduction. It's like this girl is blind, but she's also Thanos level threat. After the funeral, Darren Wilden, this detective here, Crusslord, Detective Crusslord Darren Wilden, he tells the girls that Alston's disappearance is now a murder case because they found the body. And he tells them that he'll be watching them closely. So he clearly thinks that one of these four, if not multiple, are responsible for Alison's D-E-A-T-H, death. At this point, all four girls get a text from A. It's the first group text from A. I'm still here, bitches, and I know everything. A. That is the pilot episode. When that aired for the first time in 2010 and I saw it, I was on the floor fighting for my life, gasping for air because that episode ended me. Can you imagine? How old was I? 15. And there's this TV show about 15, 16 year old. One of them's dead. They're being threatened. There's so much going on. There's a blind girl who's Thanos. So episode two is called The Jenna Thing. Now, The Jenna Thing, capital T, capital J, capital T, is the number one reason why the girls don't go to the police about A in season one. Because you may be thinking, as I'm talking about what happens, they're like, this person is literally endangering your lives. Why are you not talking to the police or talking to your parents about this? And it's because of the Jenna thing. So in light of Alison's body being found, Spencer decides to tell the girls that she has suddenly remembered that the summer that Ali disappeared, so 2009, she mentioned dating an older boy who Spencer did not know the name of. She also says Alison mentioned that this older boy had a girlfriend. Arya starts to get a whiff that Byron is hooking up with Meredith again. So she confronts him about she's being shady boots towards him. Emily and Maya are getting closer and closer. Maya's quite a flirty character. So she keeps dropping hints that she would like to be more than friends with Emily. And she's also keeps mentioning that it's weird living in the De Laurentiis house because she keeps finding things that are Allison's. That will become important later. So this Aria Ezra relationship is called Ezria. That's the ship, hashtag Ezria. Could not hate it more. This relationship between these two characters is predatory. And the show does the absolute most throughout the series to make us be like, oh my gosh, hashtag couple goals. They, they can't split up Ezria. That's my number one ship. Love exists because Ezra, sorry, I'm gonna stop this accent. They keep, basically they, they want us to like these two together. And at the time, I think a lot of people were like, yes, yes, we love them. But watching it back, it's like, what the fuck? If you think about the target audience for this show, these are like 14 
to 16 year old girls and they're watching this TV show where there's so many relationships between 23 to 25 year old men and girls aged 14 to 16. And they're like being told that this is not only acceptable, but it's like something that you should want. <sighs> this man, Ezra Fitz is not seeing heaven and I'll make sure of it. So in terms of relationships, we have Arya and Ezra. We have Hannah dating Sean, Emily dating a crusty named Ben. While dating Ben, Emily is starting to develop a crush on Maya, hello LGBTs. And Spencer has a crush on Ren, who is Melissa's fiance. So in episode two, we get a flashback reveal of what the Jenna thing is. In the flashback, the five of them, so including Allison, are trying on clothes in, I think it's Emily's bedroom. And Allison looks out the window and she thinks she sees Toby Kavanagh spying on them getting changed. And she's like, that creep Toby. She's like, we need to teach him a lesson. They go to Toby's house and she throws a stink bomb into the garage. Now the stink bomb, she threw it. Allison threw the stink bomb, but the rest of the girls were there. Now this stink bomb is giving a firework realness Katy Perry. It's a bit confusing because they call it a stink bomb, but it is a firework. Jenna is in the garage and she is blinded. So Jenna could see, but Allison and the girls by association are responsible for making Jenna go blind. That's the Jenna thing. Now menace of the millennium, Allison to the rentist decides, well, shit, we just blinded someone. We better make sure that Toby is made responsible for it. And he just has to sit there and take it because Allison is blackmailing Toby with something. And it's alluded to, but at this point we don't know what it is. Take my jacket off, I'm cooking, babe. Yes, thank you for asking. I am wearing a piece of Planet M. So we find out the blackmail is Toby and Jenna are step-siblings. Allison finds out that Toby and Jenna have been hooking up. <gasps> Drama. So that's the blackmail that Allison's holding over Toby, that he is forcing Jenna into this relationship. But we find out later on that it's actually Jenna that's forcing Toby into the relationship and blackmailing him into the relationship. But Allison's using it against Toby, which is double fucked up. Couple of notes. First thing is Allison is just an absolute piece of shit in the flashbacks. She is a horrible human being. In almost every single flashback of season one, she's either threatening someone, being rude, blackmailing her friends. She's a piece of work, but it's iconic because it's like, She's such a piece of shit that she has so many enemies. As a result, there are just so many people and like the list only grows longer as we go through the seasons. List of people that could potentially have killed Allison because she's just being an absolute piece of shit. All right, in other news, we have Spencer hooking up with Ren and Melissa finds out and calls off the engagement, Big T. Big T boots. Now hold on, actually that raises another point about the creepy age gaps in this show. Something that went wrong here is the casting of the actors compared to the ages of the characters. For example, Spencer is played by Troyan and Troyan was born in 1985 and Ren is played by Julian Morris who was born in 1983. So in real life, the difference between these two people is two years but on the show it's seven years, but it doesn't look like seven years because it's actually only two years. So as a viewer, you're kind of like, well, they look the same age, so it must be fine. There's also a similar thing with the actors for Arya and Ezra. According to actor ages, Spencer is older than Ezra. And also there is an 11 year age gap between Spencer and Allison. I think if they had aged up this entire plot somehow to make it about like university aged people, it would make more sense. They could make it darker, but I think they're relying on the source material because the same ages in the books and also the target audience because it's on ABC Family. That's why they did what they did. All right, back to the story, babe. Emily has a flashback to Allison giving the girls a bracelet each with their name on it. It's like a beaded bracelet. Allison has one too, becomes important later. At the end of episode two, we find out that blind girl boss Jenna can actually text and the girls think, oh shit, she can text, she must be A. This is just a long line. <laughs> it's just like a revolving wheel of every citizen of Rosewood and the girls just spinning and be like, yep, they could be A. So next we have the four girl bosses planning a memorial for Allison and they decide to do it at the Kissing Rock. Toby is back at school after disappearing for a year after Allison disappeared. He actually saves Emily because Emily's boyfriend Ben gets a bit aggressive with her because she doesn't want to like kiss him or something. So Toby defends Emily. We meet Noel Khan. Noel Khan, I would say keywords are 
rich asshole, sometimes a little bit slay. So he is having a party and he invites Emily and Maya and all the girls actually. And at the party, Emily and Maya kiss in a photo booth. And because it's a photo booth, they print out the photos. And before they can take the photos, someone else takes the photos. A. Spencer has a flashback to this menace, Alison De Laurentiis, calling Hannah a, let me check my notes, she calls Hannah a fat loser. Because Hannah wants to come clean about the Jenna thing to the police, and Alison's like, you're a fat loser. So they're at the Kissing Rock trying to plan the memorial, and they hear a rustling in the bushes, and they chase the person, and they find Alison's friendship bracelet that she was wearing when she disappeared. Tom thinks that Hannah is acting out because she doesn't have a father figure living with her because he divorced Ashley, has a new girlfriend named Isabel, fiance at this point, I think, and Isabel has a daughter, Kate. I deliberately didn't put the Kate plot lines in this, but they are crusty. This crust right here, like a scab that I want to flick off the story. Like Kate is just so one dimensional villain vibes. It just, it's not good. Like if you compare it to one of our iconic villains, Jenna, she has so many plot lines with so many characters. She's heavily involved in the plot and she is portrayed as a villain, but then you compare it to Kate or Meredith in season three, and they're just kind of like, they can't compete when they don't compare. Toby and Emily are assigned to lab partners in every single scene that Toby's in in season one. He's getting the shady boots edit. Like imagine this was Drag Race, you know that snake rattle sound? Every single scene he's getting that. So now it starts to get a bit juicy because Ella Montgomery, Arya's mother, gets a letter from A. And the letter says that Byron has been hooking up with Meredith and Arya knows about the whole thing. Like the summary is, A is booked and busy, right? In episode five, we meet Ezra's college friend, Hardy, who doesn't get a picture on the wall because he's irrelevant. And he's played by Patrick J. Adams, who is coincidentally married to Troy and Belisario, which is fun. Also, here's a fun fact for you. According to YouTube comments, <laughs> Troyan broke up with him and he auditioned so he could be around her on set and get her back. A love story a trillion times better than this crustiness. Around about the same time we are introduced to Spencer's season one love interest, Alex. Alex's main personality traits are that he hates rich people, which is fun because she is rich people. Here's a fun piece for you. Apparently in episode five, Toby was supposed to die. That didn't happen. Speaking of Toby, we find out in episode six that he has a tattoo that says 901 free at last, which is interesting because 901 is the date that Allison went missing. Dun, dun, dun. Here we have Mona and she's being an absolute piece of work to Lucas, just bully vibes. And it's interesting because in the flashbacks, Allison is like the most popular girl and she's super mean to Mona, who is like the nerdy, can't dress girl, nerdy can't dress, bad fashion girl. And now she is like slay queen, popular girl boss, good fashion girl. And he's the same as she used to be. Like smart, no friends, Lucas, poor Lucas, no friends, no fashion. So I would say Mona's key words in season one are popular fashion bitch. And look, if you take away all the horrible rude shit she says, She's an icon. Episode seven, we find out that Jenna has a seeing eye dog named Shadow. Shadow's really cute. We never see Shadow again. Random piece of information from the night that Allison disappeared. We find out from Detective Wilden that Toby called Allison the night she disappeared. I can't remember when the call is. So it's Allison's memorial time. And guess who turns up? This crusty Ian Thomas. Melissa's ex turns up at Allison's memorial and is like, babe, what the fuck? Why are you here? Now, remember that bracelet that they found in the woods? They find out that it is fake because Jason has the real one and gives it to them as like a keepsake at the memorial. So what does that tell us? That tells us that A is capable of just making shit up and just like giving them fake pieces of information that they can't really do anything with because they don't know if it's real or not. So this memorial, it's like a fun little like concrete statue with some tile and it gets trashed. We find out later, trashed by Lucas, because he's basically like, she was a piece of shit. She was horrible, 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 nasty, nasty girl. Grace and decorum of a reversing dump truck. In episode nine, Arya sings randomly. Also, Emily has flashbacks to Alison queer baiting her and making fun of her when she made advances. So that's fun. Guys, I'm exhausted, I need to take a break. But no, we must persevere. A sends a video to the Rosewood Police Department. It's a video of Alison. Now, this is a major piece of plot. So pay attention. We know the video is from the night she disappeared because she's wearing that stupid yellow blouse. And the video is of Alison saying, you know you want to kiss me. 
You know you want to kiss me. I know you want to kiss me. As she's saying it to someone who's holding a handheld camera. Episode 10 is Mona's birthday. Around about this time, a piece of evidence arrives. In the video, it turns out Alison is wearing Toby's sweater. Everybody screamed. And then the sweater is found in Alison's bedroom with blood on it. And this I don't think is ever really explained how the blood gets on the sweater. Why don't we check in with the parents, see how they're going. These two girlies, Hannah and Ashley, are strapped for cash. Ashley decides to steal a lot of money from a old dying lady and her safety deposit box. So slay girl boss there. Season one, Pam Fields actually invented homophobia. At Camp Mona, so much shit goes down. Emily, where is she? She's here. She's driving to Camp Mona. Toby randomly pops up in her car. He's just popped up in the back seat, stream back seat by Charlie XCX. And he's like, thanks for getting me away from Jenna. So this is when they find out that Jenna is crusty predator and she pressured Toby into the step sibling relationship, not the other way around. And he also tells Emily a big T boots piece of information. He called Allison to say thank you for getting him away from Jenna. The Toby call, Toby meet up. Toby says Allison was cold, which is why he gave her his sweater. Dun, 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 dun. That means that Toby is excused from killing Allison. Toby also says, he saw Allison get in a car with an older man. Spencer finds a beaded bracelet with Jenna's name on it. Hannah sees Arya get in a car with Mr. Fitz. She also sees someone in a black hood write, I see you on the back of Ezra's car. She sees that the person who wrote it was Noel Khan. So Hannah texts the girls that she knows who A is. She goes to meet them in the car park and as she's running through the car park, my bestie Hannah gets hit by a car. And then the other girls get the text, she knew too much from A. And it's implied that Hannah thinks A is Noel, but A doesn't know that. So it seems A only knows Hannah thinks she knows A's identity, which suggests that, what? A only knows that Hannah sent the message saying, I know who A is. So the implication here is that A can read every single text message that the girls send to each other, or basically any message they send from their phones, which it shocks me that they didn't realize that. But also they're 16, so maybe it's a forgivable plot hole. And then at the end of the same episode that Hannah gets hit by a car, we get another piece of the you know you want to kiss me video and it turns out the camera turns around and it's Ian fucking Thomas. While in hospital Hannah has a hallucination of Alison coming to visit her and checking up on her and seeing if she's okay and Hannah's like babe what are you doing why don't you just come back to Rosewood and hallucination Alison is like it's not safe for me to do so. Melissa and Ian are suddenly engaged and then married. It feels very shotgun vibe. Krusty needs an alibi time to marry Melissa with quickness and haste. Post hospital, Hannah discovers that her mother, Ashley, has been stashing money in the lasagna box. That will become important later. Now, because Melissa and Ian are getting married, Ian's shit is all around the Hastings house. So Spencer's seeing a lot of his shit and she sees on his golf bag that he is a tag for a place called Hilton Head. And she has a flashback to Alison having a similar bag tag when she returned from having a summer with her grandma in Georgia. But the thing is, Hilton Head is in South Carolina, not Georgia, bruh. Ian and Alison were at Hilton Head together the weekend she disappeared. In other news, the money is stolen from the lasagna box. And A says to Hannah that they'll give the money back if she eats a whole bunch of cupcakes, making Hannah remember her eating disorder days. This is fucking dark, this section. Now remember, Pam invented homophobia in season one of Pretty Little Liars, and she finds a bit of weed. Is that a weed in Maya's mint box? And she's like, yes, an opportunity to get rid of her. Pam tells Maya's parents, Maya's parents send her off to like a rehab camp thing called True North. And this will pick up in season two. Melissa tells Spencer that she is pregnant with Ian's child. Disgusting. Now Noel is continuing his sleigh of blackmailing Ezra. And he's like, if you don't give me the Supreme Girl Boss grade right now, I'm gonna dub you into the principal and it's over for you and you're gonna get fired. A plants test answers in Noel's locker. So then Noel gets suspended for cheating. And A does that because A wants to have the fun. A's like, nobody gets to play with my dolls. That's for me, doll. And then Ian's looking mighty suspicious because the girls get more of the video footage. The camera turns back around and Alison falls to the ground and you can see like her hand like on the ground and it's like pulls some of the dirt together and then goes flat. And they're like, oh my God, he killed her. So then they're like, this is literal evidence that Ian killed Alison. And they go to take it to the police, but then A deletes it off Emily's laptop. A takes the video, but gives them a photo of Alison in her backyard and she's like, looks like she's running away from someone and there's like a shadow 
of someone behind her. The photo was taken the night that Alison disappeared because she was wearing the crusty yellow top and we also find out that it's Spencer's shadow. Excuse me? In episode 14 we meet Caleb Rivers. He is Hannah's techno boy toy. His whole existence is basically Hannah's boyfriend plus fills any plot holes that require knowledge of technology or being able to hack shit or decode shit. Now to make things interesting, Caleb is also a foster child and he is also homeless and he lives in the school and like around episode 20-ish he lives in Hannah's basement. While he's living in the basement we also get that scene, the infamous Caleb shower scene. Bit spicy in it. In episode 15 we meet Paige McCullers. Now Paige is introduced as girly with Bob and anger issues. She's on Emily's swim team and she's pissed that Emily is backslaying in the pool because Paige wants to be captain and Emily is jeopardizing the chances of that happening. She makes a homophobic comment and then coach finds out so Paige tries to drown Emily. Yep. Jumping ahead a little bit here, these two start dating. How did you two meet? Mm. She tried to kill me. Now Spencer follows up the lead on the bracelets because she's like if I find who bought the Allison and Jenna bracelets then I can work out who A is. She goes to the store and the lady's like, oh, these were bought by Spencer Hastings. Like, let's be real. A is absolutely eating the girls up in season one. Like they do not stand a fucking chance. Just on the Spencer shadow quickly, we find out that Spencer is like running after Allison because she's confronting her about the Melissa Ian thing. So Allison's holding it over Spencer and Spencer's like, can you fucking not? So it's basically that. My God, there's also this ridiculous plot line about Toby giving Spencer the numbers 214. And he's like, this is important information about Jenna. And they work out it's the number of a hotel room, sorry, a motel room. And it turns out Jenna's sitting in there playing the flute. Jenna and that fucking flute. Jenna invented the flute, guys. Pam invented homophobia. Jenna invented the flute. But then there's also this dumb plot line that Ian gives Jenna a bag and he's like whispering like, gives her the bag and then we find the bag in the motel room but there's nothing in it and we never find out what was in the fucking bag ever it's a plot hole Marlene Marlene the school has a play and the girls find a bloodied trophy and the trophy has Ian's name on it and it's got blood on it and they're like oh my god this is the murder weapon and they take it to the police and it turns out it was planted by A and it's got rat blood on it R.I.P. to that rat though that is part of the reason why they can't trust the police because bitch the police don't trust them because they gave them a fake rat blood trophy. And they're like, this is the murder weapon. Please like baby joking. In episode 19, we meet Garrett Reynolds. He doesn't start out crusty, then he becomes crusty. And then in season three, he's slightly less crusty. So Garrett's a police officer and we find out he's been assigned to the Alison de Laurentiis case. Now he has a bit of history here because he knows all of the girls because he grew up in Rosewood. I think he was actually maybe Emily's neighbor, like across the road. Lord, we also get the scene of Emily and Paige doing karaoke. Na, 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 na. Melissa tells Spencer that she was with Ian the weekend that he was at Hilton Head. We later find out that she was there, but she was in a different room. Hannah and Caleb have S-E-G-G-S -G -G in episode 19, which actually exposes a plot hole because it's implied that the events of the last few episodes happened in January, February, because the old lady actually stole money from, died, and her gravestone says 2011. But in episode 20 of season two, Caleb's laptop password contains 1105, which is apparently the first night they had S-E-G-G-S. You know you wanna kiff me. Sorry about the jump scare. <laughs> Why not just put the Allison wig on? I'm saving the Allison wig for like maybe season four for obvious reasons for those who know. But then I thought, you know what, let's just chuck it on for the rest of season one for the vibes. In episode 20, we find out that Caleb has been paid to spy on Hannah by who? Jenna. That's right, this big line here. So Jenna is paying Caleb to look for a key. Now this key opens a like storage container and inside the storage container is a USB. That on the USB is a video of Jenna and Toby. And that's what Jenna's looking for because that's Allison's blackmail over the both of them. Hannah finds out and Caleb could not be more cancelled. Also around this time we find out that Caleb's like locker key is 214. And for what? Like why would you do that? It's so it makes it so confusing. Aria finds out that Ezra, 23 slash 24 year old Ezra, has an ex-fiance named Jackie. I actually probably should have printed Jackie and put her on the wall. I don't know why she didn't make it. And he just didn't tell Aria. Girl, like there are so many red flags and that's just the fucking start. Caleb skips town to get on the homeless bus 
or something. I'm not trying to be rude, I just can't even remember what it's called. They just frame it as he's homeless and he's going on a bus. So it's the homeless bus? I don't know. And he writes a love letter for Hannah and gives it to Mona. Mona chucks it in the bin. Guys, you want a fun fact? Around this time, um, Arya stalks Ezra's ex-fiance Jackie on Facebook. But whenever she says Facebook, it's dubbed to say website. So remember those videos that Jenna was looking for? Well, babe, in episode 21, the girls, they go to the shipping container, find the USB. And the USB has like videos of not only this relationship, but of the girls changing of Wilden and Ashley hooking up. That's when the girls realize that this relationship is not what they thought it was. So that's when they become Toby stands. That opens the door for Spoby. Yes, Spencer and Toby. This couple has no chemistry, babe. None whatsoever. All right, girls. <sighs> Season one finale. Can you keep up? Na na na. Let me lose my marbles. Ezra tells Arya that he's resigning from Rosewood High School and taking a job at Hollis College. The liars find out from Jenna that Allison came to visit her at the hospital the day she disappeared and blackmailed her to never reveal the Jenna thing. Babe, let's put it on the timeline. So there we go. At this point, the girls are really like sure that Ian is shady boots up to some shit like potentially killed Allison. This man right here, look at him, crusty. And we're supposed to believe that he's like one of the most attractive people in Rosewood. Was no one else available? Why am I so shady with this damn wig on? They text Ian from a burner phone trying to prove he's guilty by saying for him to meet at a spot with 10K in exchange for the videos he took. Jenna finds out that they have the videos, which is why they confront her. She tells the Allison story. She tells Ian that they have the videos. We also find out that Jenna is dating Garrett. Garrett is like 24. Jenna is 16. What number is that? That's like... Crustiness number five? Crusty number five. Melissa is at the church planning the unborn baby's christening and Spencer picks her up. Melissa left her phone in the church and Spencer's like, okay, girl boss, let's go back and get it. A car rams them and it's apparently a hit and run. Like it wasn't like A or Ian or anyone. It's just like a random car hit them. How fucking convenient is that? So Spencer and Melissa, they have to go to the hospital. The rest of the girls are in the middle of fucking nowhere trying to trap Ian and Garrett's there too since Emily filled him in. Now remember Garrett's like family friends, childhood friends vibes with all of them so they trust him. Garrett, bestie, this could be dangerous. Could you like help us out? A random guy shows up with the 10K to take the videos, not Ian, and Garrett sends the guy off. So he's like, give me the money, you leave. And they're all like, what the fuck, bro? And Spencer's like, oh my God, yeah, that's right. Melissa lost her phone in the church. Better go back and get that for my sissy. And she finds Ian there and he's fucking furious, right? He doesn't give a shit about that baby. Like, they're all like, Ian, get to the hospital. No answer. He, Spencer gets to the church and he's there. And he's fucking furious about the videos. Not about your wife nearly dying in a hit and run. I hate this man for real. He tells Spencer that he's going to kill her and stage it as an S word. Now get this right. This is the spiciest bit of the whole season. Crust Lord, Chief of the Crusts, Ian, tries to kill Spencer by pushing her off the church bell tower. Spencer's fighting for her life. And then someone in a black hoodie, could it be... A arrives and pushes Ian off the bell tower. The rest of the girls arrive and they see Ian's body all tangled up in the ropes at the bottom of the bell tower. And the police arrive and they're like, babe, there's no body here, all making shit up. And they go and have a look and Ian's body's not there anymore. Who took the fucking body? Also critical pieces of information. When the black hoodie person pushes Ian off the bell tower, he looks at them and he says, what are you doing here? So it would seem that Ian knows the person in the hoodie. Oof. All right, so that brings us to the end of season one. Why don't we do a police and logic check-in? Why haven't they told the police about A? Because A knows about the Jenna thing and heaps of other things that could get them in trouble. Do you think you going to prison for blinding this girl boss right here is worse than dying? These four didn't even throw the stink bomb slash firework. I get that the police are literal trash with Wilden and Garrett and all that kind of shit. But like, tell your parents then. Like, Veronica is a literal lawyer. Also, in terms of logic, they don't seem to realize that their phones are bugged. Like, A was literally sending texts to each other from their own phones, and they didn't realize that they should maybe get a new phone. All right, so this is how the plot of Pretty Little Liars looks at the end of season one. Have a look, take it in. Da -da 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 -da. It's a new dawn, a new day. And I'm feeling slay. It is time to do season two. Now, I went and put the connections up on the wall and I have to say, 
the slain which is being slain on this wall right now it's almost obscene i just know my landlord's gonna be like um bestie take that off the wall now put that down and if that's the case i'm gonna be like bestie this carpet is getting in my lungs it like gets in the air and then it just goes everywhere it's evil in terms of new additions we have Samara, who was actually introduced in season one, but she has more of a role in season two. She's Emily's new GF, and she lasts like eight episodes before A minimizes her sleigh. Next, we've got Dr. Sullivan. Now, Dr. Sullivan, that's my bestie right there. Dr. Sullivan needs to be renamed to Dr. Slay because that's what she did. Like, look at that hair, she came to slay. And who was gonna stop her? No one, well, I mean, someone did stop her, but more on that later. We also have Vivian Darkbloom, mm. Mm-hmm, that wig. PLL costume department, not seeing heaven. We also have Jonah and Duncan and they are related to Vivian. And also we have Holden attached to Arya. So those are the new additions to the wall. Just a quick note on the difference between the green lines and the red lines. So green lines are season two, red lines are season one. That doesn't mean that characters who have red lines between each other aren't gonna interact in season two. It just means like a new type of interaction is being realized. Season two is the second highest rated season overall by critics and fans. And it also has some of the highest rated episodes overall, specifically the season finale. So episode one of season two, also known as episode 23 overall, picks up immediately after the events of the season one finale. So after the police tell the girls that Ian's body is no longer in the bell tower, Garrett has to take them to the police station and he tells them on the way that they need to sort out their story because he wants to protect them. He wants to protect himself. He tells the girls that they should not include the part where they tried to blackmail Ian with the $10,000 for the videos, right? He doesn't want the police to know he was involved in that. And he also doesn't want the police to get a hold of the videos. Now, after the little trip to the police station, they give their statements and everything. The police don't really believe them. The next day, Veronica Hastings and the other parents have decided that the girls need to go to therapy for their obsession with blaming Ian, which is like such bad parenting. It's like, you girls are just so bad. Jenna and Garrett are in Garrett's car talking about how Jason has moved back into the De Laurentiis house since Maya was express FedEx shipped over to True North, the weed camp, if you remember, that Pam instigated. Actually, she's no longer homophobic in season two. Suddenly she's like, yes. She's like every company in June. I hate, wait, no. I'm done hating. And Jenna and Garrett refer to something called the Jason thing. So we have the Jenna thing, and now we have the Jason thing. Now, Emily's dad, he's famously in the army. He's a BTS stan. <laughs> and as part of being in the army, he has this whole thing that he needs to relocate to Texas to train recruits or something, I don't know. All of season two, they are moving to Texas. Enter stage left, Dr. Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan is probably one of my favorite characters of this entire series because I just love like every scene that she's in. She's always like, hmm, that's suspicious. That's weird. She's the therapist that the parents have organized for the girls to go to. And I remember when Caleb got on the homeless bus, well, he's back and he's living with Lucas. For most of season two, Mona is dating Noel Khan. And I actually really like this pairing because Menace A, Menace B, A plus B equals C, Menace. And it also makes sense because they're both like really popular and horrible. So good for them. At therapy, the girls are like, wait, maybe we should tell this girl boss with the bob right here, Dr. Sullivan about A. Cause they haven't really told anyone about A at this point, but A is ruining their lives, babe. So like, we're gonna tell Dr. Sullivan. And as they're about to tell Dr. Sullivan, they see on the wall of her office that Ezra's diploma is there. And they're all like, <gasps> how did that get there? Bitch, A stole it from Ezra's apartment and put it there. And they're like, shit, no one's safe. So then they backtrack on the plan. They're like, okay, we're not gonna tell Dr. Sullivan about A. Also around this time, Spencer finds out that Melissa is getting texts from an unknown number pretending to be Ian. So remember, Ian got pushed up the bell tower. Spencer assumes he's dead. No one else thinks Ian's dead. They think he's just run away. Melissa's getting texts from Ian. Spencer's like, wait, hold one. What's all this about? Now get this bullshit, okay? In episode 24, there's a scene of a dog trying to dig up something in the front yard of the De Laurentiis house. And it's kind of framed as, oh my God, what is that dog digging up in the front yard? Like, ooh who or what is buried in the front yard of the De Laurentiis house. And there's a scene where Jason has dug up the spot where the dog was previously digging and the girls see him and they're like, what are you doing? And he's like planting. And he's being super shady, implying that he's not planting and there's something in the dirt, but it's never fucking explained ever. Speaking of ridiculous subplots in the first half of season two, we have this subplot of a lot of the houses in Rosewood being broken into. 
and Arya is in Spencer's house, sees this person running down the stairs, they're wearing a black hoodie, and they fucking yeet Arya into the wall, and she's like, ooh, doo, doo, doo. Like, she actually gets fucking, like, thrown across the room vibes. And it turns out, it's Mike. Mike is truly a menace for, like, 15 episodes of season two. Around about episode 25, Mona comes up to Arya and says, hey, big A. That's not suggestive at all. I remember being in the trenches on Tumblr, fighting for the Arya is A theory, and that was like our prime piece of evidence. Remember that the Hastings house and the De Laurentiis house are next to each other. Well, in episode 25, Spencer sees a shadowy figure in the window and she thinks it's Ian. It's not Jason because he's outside the front of the house. We never fucking find out who it is in the window. It could not have been Ian because a little bit jumping ahead here, Ian actually died, babe. And then we find out later that he'd been dead for a week when they find the body, which means he died the night of the bell tower shenanigans. So it could not have been him in the window. Some of the girlies on Reddit think that it was Peter Hastings, but it was never actually confirmed by the show. In episode 26, these anonymous texts that Melissa is getting from someone who is pretending to be Ian, the texts are from A. And A is texting Melissa as Ian saying, babe, I need painkillers. So. Melissa hits up her ex-fiance, Ren, who works in the hospital. And she's like, bestie, I need some painkillers. Spencer finds out about this and she works with Ren to set a trap for Ian. Melissa and Ren, who is playing double agent for Spencer and Melissa, they go to meet Ian in a barn outside of town and they find Ian's dead body with a crusty, like bloody wound in his head and a gun next to him with an apparent S word letter. In this letter, Ian is apparently confessing to killing Alison. In the next couple of episodes, we have a different girl boss entering the arena of Slay, Emily. And she works out that this apparent S word letter is made up of text that A has sent the girls. So they work out that A has forged this note. It also turns out that Ian has been dead for a week. So the theory is he shot himself and then his body was moved to this barn and then someone wrote the letter pretending to be him saying that he killed Allison. A is not fucking playing around. Also, we need to put a cross on him because he's confirmed dead at this point. Oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh. This whole plot line is so freaking messy. Like what I told you about Ian dying the night that all happened and then his body being moved and this whole thing being staged. We don't find that out from the show. We find that out from Marlene in an interview like a year later. In the show, it's implied that he was killed by someone and we're like, oh, will we ever find out who killed Ian? No. And when you find out who A is, that kind of behavior doesn't even make sense. Like they would not have been able to move the body. Now, ultimate Slay Queen bestie, Dr. Sullivan, her office has been trashed, shit everywhere, right? And there's a message on the wall that says, nosy bitches die. That's so fucking iconic. Also in season two, Jason is shirtless for like 80% of the time. Someone please buy Jason a shirt, he's run out. Also, Toby Kavanagh has a whole bunch of shirtless scenes and it's very clearly that they're trying to be like, wow, look how hot Keegan Allen is. This is a little treat for our predominantly female audience. But then the character is 16. This actor is like 24, 25. So it's like, okay, Slay, good for you. Enjoy those abs, sir. In episode 27, we find out that the Jason thing is referring to the night after Alice and De disappeared. Jason got a letter, a handwritten letter saying, I know what you did. And he doesn't remember what he did because he's high on drugs and he'd been drinking that night. A gives the girls another piece of the video. After Alison falls to the ground and grabs the dirt, as we previously mentioned, she gets up giggling, Ian gives her a kiss and leaves. Alison was still alive when Ian left her, which means he didn't kill her and the confession note was fake. Jessica De Laurentiis is back in town and she wants to do a memorial thing at the fashion show for Alison because Alison was Slay Queen who loved fashion. All you need to know about this fashion show episode is that at the end of the fashion show, the girls are modeling some of Ali's outfits and A puts a video on the projector basically calling Ali the devil and having the bitches dead. There's also a scene of Jessica De Laurentiis and Peter Hastings having a fight at the fashion show, but we can't hear what they're saying. Pam Fields moves to Texas to be with her BTS stan husband and Emily moves in with Hannah and Ashley. These two are fully dating at this point and Toby is in his construction worker era. So Peter Hastings hires Toby to do some construction in the backyard. And while he's doing so, Toby finds a half buried broken hockey stick 
on the property line between the Hastings house and the De Laurentiis house. And Peter Hastings sees him find it, gets really weird and shady about it, and fucking burns it. It's implied that the hockey stick is a piece of evidence, potentially the murder weapon used to kill Allison. And we also have Spencer having flashbacks of Jason, like swinging on Allison with a hockey stick. So now they think that Jason's a, Jason killed it with the hockey stick, Jason buried the hockey stick, blah, blah, blah. Without giving away too much, a couple of seasons later, we find out that Peter thinks that someone he's related to murdered Allison with the hockey stick. Midway through season two, we get a little bit of flirtatious action between Aria Montgomery and Jason De Laurentiis, and I think they actually kiss once or twice, just once. Ezra finds out about it and he gets really jealous. I wish these two had got together, but it also gets creepy in like two episodes. When is this show not fucking creepy? Also, that is still a weird age couple. In episode 30, Emily is slaying in the pool, like slaying harder than usual. And we find out it's because A injected growth hormones into her shoulder cream. She gets a stomach ulcer from stress and goes to hospital where she has to beg Ren not to share the drug report because otherwise she'll never get into college. Like, sorry, what? go to the police. With Emily in the hospital dealing with the ulcer shenanigans, it's a perfect opportunity for Spencer to go to the morgue. The more I read this, I'm like, this is ridiculous. She goes to the morgue to look up Allison's file to find out if Allison was murdered with a hockey stick because that would implicate Peter and potentially Jason. She finds out that the murder weapon had a curved blunt edge, which could be the hockey stick and the impact was on the back of her skull. They also find out that she was breathing dirt when she died, which means she was buried alive. We also find out that page five of the autopsy report is missing. The fucking page five, this plot hole haunts me. More on that probably season three. Also in episode 30, Marlene's favorite bestie, Caleb, who fills every plot hole, he's being followed by someone who Hannah assumes is an FBI agent, but is actually a PI hired by his mother. So he goes to Montecito where this lady apparently lives and she's apparently very rich and slay. Episode 31 is a mess. I kind of want to sit down to discuss this. We find out that Jason has a dark room of photos of Aria sleeping, but wait, Jason didn't take them. Alison De Laurentiis took photos of Ari Montgomery sleeping. He found the negatives and developed them. What the fuck? Why was Alison taking photos of Ari sleeping? It is never explained. Why include it at all? That's what I mean about having 10 to 12 episode seasons. You wouldn't have weird subplots like that that eventuate to nothing. In episode 32, Spencer and Toby, Spoby, they're doing some digging out of Ian's belonging because Ian died. They find his yearbook and in his listing in the yearbook, it says he was part of NAT club. And she knows every single club at the school. So she's like, wait a minute, hold on. That's not a real club, or at least isn't now. So they do some more digging. And it turns out there are other people in Ian's yearbook who are part of NAT club. Guess who? Jason D. Swag Rentis and Garrett Reynolds. Dun, dun, dun. Spencer and Toby find out that NAT stands for NOS, Animad verto totus, which translates to we see all. Remember those videos of the girls changing, secret hookups, the Jenna Toby blackmail, taken by the NAT club. What the fuck? Emily gets a massage, unbeknownst to her, it's from A. And when we find out who A is, it's a plot hole because the person who gave the massage is someone that's implied to be hired by A, but that person is not hired by A until the end of the season two. That chunk of episodes is just plot hole after plot hole. Episode 32, we find out Dr. Sullivan has been treating A. Episode 33, the girls decide to tell Dr. Sullivan about A, which is huge. Dr. Sullivan works out who A is that night. These girls have been dealing with this shit for how many months? Dr. Sullivan arrives on the scene, they tell her, and bitch, that night she works out who A is. A finds out that she works out who A is, and A kidnaps her son and blackmails her, and acts like Dr. Sullivan has been buried alive. The girls have to go find her body and dig her up. It's a mannequin in the shallow grave. And also the shovel that they've been given by A to dig up Dr. Sullivan is the murder weapon that was used to kill Allison. <laughs> Did you get all that? Also fun fact, in episode 33, Maya is back from True North Slay Camp and she has dinner with Emily at the grill and she orders calamari. But this is a plot hole because in episode 12 of season one, she tells Pam that she can't eat seafood. So, what now? When A tells the girls that they've buried Dr. Sullivan and they have to follow all the clues and instructions to work out where she is and save her, A sends Emily GPS instructions, she follows them, and it takes her to a barn with a running car in it. She gets locked in the barn, nearly dies from carbon monoxide poisoning because there's no oxygen. She gets dragged out of the barn. When she wakes up, she may or may not be hallucinating and seeing that Allison saved her. 
Emily asks Hallucination Allison if she knows who A is and she says yes, but she can't tell her. You know how I said that A gives them the shovel to dig up Dr. Sullivan, which turns out to be a mannequin. Now guess which member of the police force tells the girls they're being investigated for murder because they have the shovel. This bitch, Darren Wilden's back. In the mid-season finale, we find out from Garrett that apparently the missing autopsy report contains the analysis of trace evidence found on the body. This was an iconic episode. Pretty Little Liars does such a fantastic job of ridiculous drama and like cliffhangers in every season finale and mid-season finale. Episode 35, or season two, episode 13, is our first Halloween special. Now, what I just said about the season finales being iconic, the Halloween specials? Ain't no show topping the Pretty Little Liars Halloween specials. When I get to the Halloween train, you're gonna be gooped and gagged. Marlene truly reached into the bag of tricks and brought out the sleigh for these episodes. Like even the intros have like this special bloody hand smeared on tiled wall. The season two Halloween episode is about Halloween 2008 and thus actually acts as a prequel to the pilot. Allison's still alive and it also turns out this is when Jenna moves to Rosewood and she can of course still see at this point. There's a standoff between Allison Allison and Jenna in the costume store about who's going to wear the Lady G costume. <laughs> we also get a replay of the scene of Allison and Arya avoiding Mona and finding Arya's dad hooking up with Meredith in the back of the car. So it turns out that also happened at Halloween 2008. And we also find out that Allison was getting anonymous texts, the first few of which were not signed A. Big piece of information. Also, this might not sound relevant now, but it becomes a piece of plot later on. She also gets sent a doll with pins in it and a note that says, it's my turn to torture you. And she hides the note in the head of one of her other dolls. Here's a great example of Alison being an absolute fucking menace. So, Arya has just found out that her father, Krusty Byron, is cheating on Ella with Meredith. The girl's are getting ready for the party and Arya says she feels that pure shit, babe. She doesn't want to go, she just want to go home. And Allison blackmails her with her dad's infidelity to go to the party. Because that's what besties do, right? Okay, it is time to discuss the Lady G costume showdown of Halloween 2008 in Pretty Little Liars. First off, we have Jenna Marshall slaying as Lady Gaga. Then we have Allison De Laurentiis as Lady G. This is a historical artifact to me, specifically this wig. This wig should be in a museum. I fucking love this photo. I use it as a reaction meme all the time. It's one of my favorite photos ever. Someone needs to go to jail for this wig. At the party, Allison offers Jenna a spot in her posse, in her squad. She's like, I can make life very easy for you in Rosewood. And Jenna's like, nah, babe, I'd like to pick my own friends, thanks. And from then on, Allison hates Jenna. Gives her a little bit of ammunition. She's like, oh, maybe I'm gonna blind her. In this episode, Allison plays a prank on her besties because she's a genuine criminal level of menace, as we know, and they try and rescue her from being attacked by a creepy doll costume in a spooky house. Allison organized it with Noel, and he's playing the part of the doll, except he's not. He never made it to the house. So who was attacking Allison in the doll costume? I don't think we ever actually find out. At the end of the episode, Allison gets a text saying, dying to know who I am, you'll find out dash a so this is one of the first a messages also in this episode it's a bunch of hints towards twin theory specifically like photos in allison's room and stuff overall ridiculously iconic episode one of my favorites for sure okay back to episode 36 and back to real-time antics the girls are doing community service for stealing the murder weapon <laughs> also we're made to hate jackie remember fucking jackie jackie's not on the wall but Ezra was engaged to Jackie and we're made to hate her because she tells Arya that the relationship should not be happening. She tells Ezra the relationship should not be happening because she's underage and she's a student. And we're supposed to be like, ew, Jackie's getting in the way of true love. Jackie was right. Also in episode 36, Ezra and Arya tell Byron and Ella about their relationship and Mike punches Ezra. Very fun. Maybe I'm a mic stand now. Our two slay queens, Spencer Hastings and Emily Fields, come up with a plan to trap A by pretending that they're fighting and pretending that Emily is the weakest link. Therefore, Emily wants to make a deal with A by giving A information they found in Allison's belongings that Maya found in the De Laurentiis house. A meeting gets set up between A and Emily and Emily meets A in a greenhouse with the information that doesn't exist and A tries to kill her for it. I was gonna say this is a plot hole, but it's not really, it's more of a red herring. When Emily meets A in the greenhouse, A is taller and bigger than Emily. When we find out who A is, they do not fit that description. So we're like maybe someone else like a minion, someone on the A team was there. No, it's the person who ends up being A. It's just them putting a bigger build person to throw people off the scent. 
Like, that's just so evil. As if it isn't hard enough trying to work out who A is in this show, then they go and do that shit. Like, that's just not fair. Spencer and Arya arrive on the scene at the greenhouse, and A can't fight three of these girl bosses all at once. So A runs off, nearly gets hit by Hannah in her car, and A drops their phone. Fun little callback to when A ran Hannah over in the Camp Mona episode of season one. The girls get Rosewood's Mark Zuckerberg, Caleb, to hack the phone. This next fucking, ugh, bullshit. I'm just gonna read it. We're not gonna discuss it. Emily gets a job at Rosewood's Crisis Hotline Center and thinks a call from Lucas is about the greenhouse battle. Thus they think Lucas is A. Like the timing is just ridiculous. Her working at the Crisis Hotline then him calling the Crisis Hotline. Also a scene where Hannah and Lucas row out onto a fucking lake and Hannah knocks Lucas into the water and they think he drowned for two episodes. Irrelevant and annoying. Lucas is an A, brackets, yet. Next we meet Holden Strauss, Arya's childhood friend, who her parents wish she was dating because he is her age and he's also not a creep. So imagine that Arya and Holden have this like plan that they pretend to go on dates when she actually meets Ezra and Holden goes to do fucking martial arts. Just too many episodes. Episode 39, we get a piece of information from the day Allison disappeared. This is the shit I fucking live for. I love this whole thing. Like when we get to season four and we find out exactly what happened this day, you're gonna be so gooped and gagged because this is like barely the fucking start of it. Remember how Hannah nearly runs A over, A drops their phone, Caleb's been hacking the phone. On the phone, Caleb finds a video and the video is of Ian, Garrett and Jenna in Allison's room the day she disappeared and they're in there looking for the NAT videos. At this point, we only get a little piece of the video, basically just those three fighting in Allison's room, and it sounds like Allison's coming up the stairs. Ian and Garrett start fighting, the camera drops on the floor. We see on the floor a fake ID of Allison with brown hair, who we'll soon find out is named Vivian Darkbloom. It's crusty ass wig. There's also a flashback of Hannah seeing Allison as Vivian at the hairdresser. And she's like, oh my gosh, you're so slay. The hair looks shit. <laughs> The way Sasha was in the trenches with these crusty wigs, like what is that about? Crusty wigs is a key part of Allison's personality. Also in episode 39, the girls find the threatening notes Allison has stashed in the doll's head from the 35th episode, remember the Halloween episode? So now they know that A was messaging Allison before she disappeared, which is pretty big actually. Episode 40, we get the best text from A in this entire series. Call off your techno boy toy or I tell the cops what your mom keeps in the lasagna box. A. Best moment of my life. I fucking love this show so much. It's so ridiculous. Like, imagine seeing that message on your TV screen with no context. You just walk in, someone's watching Pretty Little Lies and you see that shit and you're like, oh, okay. If you time traveled and showed this screenshot to a child from the middle ages, they would combust on the spot. Okay, remember how Maya has come back from weed rehab camp? She's now officially dating Emily. And Emily can tell that Maya is getting weird text messages based on how she reacts to her phone. And she thinks that Maya is possibly getting texts from A. Our resident girl boss, Spencer Hastings, has been doing some digging and she's found out that Vivian Darkbloom is an anagram for the author who wrote Lolita. Hannah's like, wait a minute, hold on. I actually have Allison's copy of Lolita. They open the book and what falls out, a claim ticket. Spencer takes the claim ticket and goes to the storage that it belongs to and finds a red raincoat, bitch, the red raincoat. Name a more iconic piece. Actually, there's three iconic pieces. Allison's hair, Allison's crusty yellow blouse, and the red raincoat. Now inside one of the pockets of the raincoat is a phone number which takes us to Jonah. Spencer finds out that her dad is actually also Jason's dad. What? Yes, you heard me right. That gigantic huge piece of tea was just randomly dropped into an episode of season two. Spencer's dad, Peter Hastings, is Jason De Laurentiis' dad. Peter Hastings cheated on Veronica Hastings, had an affair with Jessica De Laurentiis. Jessica got pregnant, had a child. That child is Jason De Laurentiis. Therefore, Jason and Spencer are half siblings. Also, Jason and Melissa are half siblings. A steals Caleb's laptop and plans sensitive school files on it. Holden roundhouse kicks Noel for trying to pull Arya down a ladder on the roof of the school. We're not getting into that, babe. We're not getting into that. The police confiscate Caleb's laptop and we have the Universal Krusties, Garrett and uh, Wilden interrogating Caleb about his password so they can get into the laptop and look for the files. Hannah and Spencer remotely unlock Caleb's laptop using the SCGGS plot hole from season one, remember that? 
11.05. They delete the plant at school files, which were in a folder named Hefty. Jason finds another box under Allison's floorboards with letters from Peter to Jessica and $15,000 in cash, which raises the question, did Allison blackmail Peter with the daddy information? And does this mean he has a motive to get rid of her? It's not unbelievable, since Allison was blackmailing almost everyone in this fucking town. In episode 42, they call the number from Vivian's red coat pocket and meet up with Guy Jonah, who says Vivian had commissioned him to track who was sending her friend Allison anonymous texts. And he gives them an address, presumably the address of the person sending the threatening texts to Allison. Also in this episode, Arya wears a necklace with the letter A on it. Again, what are you foreshadowing? Also, Arya sleeps in eyeliner. Like this girly, she basically has eyeliner tattooed on her eyelids. Good for her. In episode 43, something really interesting happens. Mona starts getting texts from A. Hannah's mommy saved her ass. Who's gonna save yours? Maya has disappeared and she's not replying to Emily's texts and or emails and or calls. Our tech boy toy Caleb has hacked more of A's phone and got another piece of the video. Remember, it sounded like Allison was coming up the stairs. It's not Allison, it's Melissa. She comes into Allison's room and she's like, where is she? So that implicates Melissa. Now we have Melissa, Ian, Garrett, and Jenna in Allison's room the day Allison disappeared. The girls follow up the address that Jonah gave them that was apparently sending Allison anonymous text messages. They get there and it's the law firm that Melissa Hastings worked at in 2008. Melissa admits to sending Allison anonymous text messages telling her to back off Ian, but she never signed them as A. At this point, the girls are like, maybe we should just give this video to the police. This seems like an important piece of information. I think at this point, the writers had done a better job than season one with giving a reason as to why the girls can't go to the police. Because by now, A has framed them a couple of times and they look like that they're withholding evidence, making shit up, and there's also crusties working on the police force. Also, I can tell that you're forgetting something important and I'm here to remind you. Don't forget that Melissa is pregnant with Ian's child. Spencer goes through Peter's checkbook trying to work out if he paid Allison 15K for her silence and she finds a check for 15K, dun dun dun, but it turns out he paid a private investigator to look for Allison after she disappeared because he knew Melissa was sending her threatening texts and needed to know if she was still alive. What a fucking plot point, that is so good. Wow, shout out to Sarah Shepard. Shout out to Marlene. Girls, you really did it. I'm loving the season two flashback era for Allison, right? She's still being an absolute menace to everyone. She's snooping around as Vivian. She's outsmarting a private investigator. And she's also got two crusty wigs. What more could you want? Jonah tells the girls that he discovered Vivian was receiving threatening texts from two numbers. So then the location of the second number is a doll hospital. Also quick side note that I've written down here, if Jonah was so savvy with finding the location of anonymous texts, why didn't they just pay him to track one of their phones to either corroborate the second address or discover who was sending them the text? I'm actually fighting for my life reading these next few sentences ahead. At the doll hospital, Aria is wearing the red coat and a guy goes, Vivian? Lord, this plotline. Absolutely nothing but rage and disappointment for this plotline from here on out. This guy is Duncan Albert and he used to take Allison flying. He saw Allison the weekend she disappeared. Aria meets up with him at an airfield to discuss further and she drives a plane. Yes, you heard me correctly. Aria drives a plane with Duncan Albert who appears for two fucking episodes and then disappears, but he actually plays an important part. So here's a summary of what we find out from the Duncan plotline. The day Allison disappeared, Duncan picked her up from Hilton Head and flew her to Philly, which means Allison was actually in Rosewood six hours before they thought she arrived from Georgia in the taxi. Episode 45, the De Laurentiis house is lit on fire with Jenna inside. Yeah. Hannah rescues her and the house blows up just a little bit, enough for dramatic effect not to actually destroy anything. I mean, the house blow up destruction comes like 50 episodes later, am I right? Uh. Jenna got a text from Jason to meet up at Jason's house, but babe, Jason never sent the text. So we're assuming that A sent the text to Jenna and A tried to kill Jenna by blowing the house up. In the next episode, we find out that Jenna has had eye surgery and she's telling people the surgery didn't work, but bitch, it actually did work. So Jenna can kind of see now. This character, even though she's a fucking menace, creep, she's such a good character. I think Jenna would have to be one of my favorite characters plot wise. She's always up to some shit. She's always got her own agenda. But as a side note, the whole A lured Jenna into the burning house to kill her doesn't really sit right with me because this iteration of A didn't kill anyone. Like there was a lot of threats to them 
plotting to kill Jenna doesn't really sit right with me. Actually, also before I forget, remember how the house was set on fire when Jenna was in it? A plants a police badge at the front of the house, which will later implicate Garrett. Spencer has a dream in which she's talking to Allison, who says not to miss what's right in front of her. I think it's like the third time one of the girls is unsure if they're hallucinating or dreaming and they see Allison. Also in episode 46, Mona gets an absolutely iconic text from A, which reads, break up Hannah and her hottie or you go back to being a junior high naughty. Don't test me. Iconic lyricism. When will Taylor? The girls go back to the doll hospital to keep following Vivian's breadcrumbs. Now this plot line, I do not endorse this buffoonery. In the doll hospital, they meet a child named Seth who apparently has some supernatural ability because he mentions knowing that Allison was buried alive, which only the liars Garrett and A know at this point. My assumption is A paid off the owner of the doll place and Seth to say that shit to spook them but it's never explicitly said. Also in other news, Byron gets Ezra fired from Hollis College. Jenna gives Toby page five of the autopsy report that Garrett gave her and tells him to give it to the police. That seems like a big deal. So now everyone is kind of going to the police with evidence, right? We've got the autopsy page. We've got the video of Allison's room. We've got some of Ali's things that Maya found. And at that moment, we see Garrett being arrested for the murder of Alison De Laurentiis. Oof, bitch, big fucking episode, right? That wasn't even a finale. But now it's time for the season two finale, episode 47. Okay, so we know the events of this episode take place in April, 2011. Garrett has been arrested and they think that he became a police officer to destroy page five of the autopsy report. That whole thing is a lot of implied work for Garrett. So he must have a really good reason for that. Hopefully you find out soon what that reason is. I'm in pain. It turns out before Maya went missing, she gave Jason a bag of stuff that she found in the dealer renter's house. And the girls are looking through the bag and they find a clue to the Lost Woods Resort. They go to the Lost Woods Resort and meet the creepy innkeeper, but don't actually find anything of value besides the fact Vivian Darkbloom had checked in twice. Oh my God, wait, that's right. There's also a scene where Jenna, who can see now, but nobody knows that, she drives to meet someone in a park and she says, what does she say? This shit doesn't make any sense. She says, they're all going to be at the party. You know what to do. Who? What do they need to do? We're not going to find out anytime soon. Forget about it. So the party that Jenna is referring to is the Masquerade Ball. Okay. Rosewood loves the dress up. Truly, they love a dress up. Big, big scenes going down at the Masquerade Ball, right? So we basically have Spencer, Emily, Aria, Hannah, and Mona. They're kind of like a group of five at the moment because Mona's also getting texts from A. So she's kind of like in with the group. At the party, Mona mentions seeing Allison dressed as Vivian spying on someone at a shop in Brookhaven near the doll shop the summer she disappeared. She tells that to, I think, Spencer. Jenna is at the party, but they don't know it's Jenna because they don't know Jenna isn't blind anymore, but Jenna doesn't have her blind glasses on. She's got a different thing on and they don't know she's sending texts. What the fuck? Spencer, because she is the girl boss of the century, she realizes we need to go back to the Lost Woods Resort and we need to look at room two, not room one. So she and Mona drive back to the Lost Woods Resort. They go to room two and what do they find? Bitch, they find A's lair. Mm-hmm, I love this lair. A's lair honestly deserves a episode of Architectural Digest Open Door series on YouTube. In the lair, there's photos of the girls, newspapers, costumes, and a whole bunch of A shit, okay? Mona finds sketches of a black swan costume that someone at the masquerade is wearing. Could it be A? Okay, next we get an absolutely iconic scene where Spencer is looking in a bag and she's like, cashmere sweaters? And she realizes that Mona is A. Yes, that is correct, ladies and ladies. Mona is A. Look, if I'm gonna be completely honest, that's my bestie and she did nothing wrong. She was fully justified in everything that she did. So Spencer realizes that Mona is A and Mona hits Spencer over the head with a flashlight and this girl boss is now unconscious. We'll talk about the A reveal in a second, but I have to say, Troy and absolutely bodied the cashmere sweaters. At the ball, we see the black swan talking to Jenna and Lucas that will become partially kind of important later. Spencer wakes up in a car with Mona driving. Mona invites Spencer to join the A-team and tells her that the reason she became A is because she hated them for stealing Hannah from her. Mmm, I don't know about all that. I guess the key context here is that Hannah used to be hefty Hannah. She was unpopular and Mona used to be loser loner Mona and she was also unpopular. And then the two of them started becoming friends 
Together, they maximized their joint slay and became popular. And then Mona's saying that the girls came back together and they took Hannah away from her. But the timeline doesn't really make sense because the texts from A are what got the girls back together in the first place. And also apparently Alison was receiving texts from A before she disappeared, unless Mona is not the A that sent Alison the text messages before she disappeared, but then why would there be two people who are not corroborating with each other texting Alison both as A? Boom. Also, Mona's a little bit cooked because if she's like, Hannah's my bestie, I want Hannah, I don't want anyone else to be friends with Hannah, girl, you ran her over with a car. Spencer manages to pull the handbrake and get out of the car and they tussle. I know you girls like to tussle. And Mona falls off the edge of a cliff and survives. I think in the book, she actually snaps her neck and dies. The police arrive and guess who's back? Dr. Sullivan. She tells the girls that Mona threatened her son, which is why she disappeared. And she diagnoses Mona with a personality disorder with which she experiences a sense of hyper reality and omnipresence. There's a scene of Mona sitting in lockup and we can hear her thoughts and she says everything is working out as planned. The police say she's criminally insane and she gets sent to Radley Sanitarium which is the big location for season three. At the end of the episode we see that Mona is in Radley and gets a visit from someone in a red coat and Mona says to this person I did everything you asked me to. Bruh. I was on the floor screaming. It was everything that I asked for and more. Marlene really came through and she did that for us. That's not the end of the episode because Maya dies. There's a scene where the song Suggestions is playing when Emily finds the ambulance and her mum tells her that Maya has been found, as in her body has been found. Very reminiscent to the pilot when Alison's body was found and Maya tells Emily that Alison's body's been found. This time her mum, Pam, tells Emily that her girlfriend Maya, who's gone missing, her body's been found. Like fuck, Emily was in the trenches this season. It's only about to get worse for her in season three. Okay, let's talk about Mona as A some more. And the whole, I did it because you stole Hannah from me, I think that would make more sense if Hannah was a little bit like better off than the rest of the girls in season one. But actually Arya, has the least impact in season one and two. Like the least shit happens to her. She gets some like messy plot lines with Ezra Crust, but that's it. The rest of them have some real major shit going on. Overall, I would say phase one of the Pretty Little Liars A overarching arc. The story of Mona being A is pretty airtight and pretty well executed. And maybe that's because at the crux of it, it's still very similar to the books. When things start splitting from the source material more in seasons like three to five, that's when we're truly in the trenches. This arc is my favorite. I do really like season four and there's some episodes in season three and season five that are really good too. But overall this story, it's pretty bloody good. This right here, Oscar worthy performance. So what you're looking at on the wall is the state of affairs at the end of the first A reveal. I decided to add the first half of season three to this video because it's still very heavily linked to the Mona is A thing, even though she's locked up in Radley. In later interviews, Marlene says that the season two finale is when the second person takes over the A game from Mona. But that doesn't really make sense, especially if Mona is saying to someone, I did everything you asked. Oh my God, wait, unless her perception was like messed up because she was on meds in the sanitarium and she thought she was talking to Alison. So then it'll make sense why she said, I did everything you asked. <gasps> Marlene, I take back everything bad I ever said about you. You're so right. The elves are zip lining and we've got, wait, what are their names again? Glizzy, Slime Girl, Blob, and Eminem. As you can see, everybody, we've added blue lines, which indicates season three. As I said before, we are doing season 3A in this video, and we'll do 3B in the next video. A lot of these lines will carry over to the next one. To be honest, I'd just like you all to acknowledge the fact that I've put an extreme slay amount of effort into this, and I'd like to give you a pointed example of such activities. This crusty right here, Holden. Look at this line. To Emily Fields. And that interaction happens like once in one episode in season three. And I'm doing this for you. Just kidding, I'm doing it for me. But you can appreciate it too. Also, as I was putting up the season three lines, I realized that I'm gonna run out of crosses real fucking quick. So at the moment, Alison's dead. 
Ian's dead, Maya's dead. By the end of this video, two more people will be dead, and yes, that's a threat. So picking up from the season two finale, we are now on episode 48, or season three, episode one, and the events of this episode are five months after the events of the season two finale. So it is now August 2011. The girls, Glizzy, Slime Girl, Blob, and Eminem are having a sleepover in guess where? Spencer's barn. Now this is very much reminiscent of the pilot and there are a lot of similarities between this episode and the first episode of season one and a lot of the plot points actually, interestingly enough. We soon find out that Emily has become a little bit of an alcoholic after Maya's death. She is not dealing with that well at all, as understandable. Also in this opening scene of season three, they're listening to s and by Rihanna. So the budget was truly secured that episode. Aria and Hannah wake up and they're like, where are these other two besties? Spencer comes in, says, I can't find Emily, babe. I'm getting flashbacks. We soon find out that Emily has dug up Allison's grave. A little bit of fun activities, August 2011, digging up Bestie's grave. Well, more accurately, Emily was too drunk to actually do the digging. So someone else has dug up the grave and Emily's standing over the open grave holding a shovel. Marlene loves a shovel and she's so correct for that. Shovels in this show mean so much. There should honestly be a picture of the shovel. So Emily is standing over Allison's open grave. The body is gone and she can't remember anything. She doesn't know how she got there. She doesn't know how she dug up the body brackets. She didn't. So let's give a quick summary of Emily's 2011 so far. We've got growth hormones in her shoulder cream, a stomach ulcer from stress. Her girlfriend was murdered and she's being framed for digging up Bestie's grave. So she's gone through it. Aria waiting for her to get some kind of issues in this show. She will get one soon, thankfully enough. Hannah went through it season one. Spencer, oh, babe, just look at the amount of lines here. She's gonna be in the trenches come season, I don't know, four or five. Also, I'd like to point out that in season three, Shay Mitchell, who plays Emily Field, absolutely demolished her performance. It was so good, so believable. Shout out to Shay Mitchell. So the girls find out where Emily has gone and they go and pick her up from the grave. And they're like, all right, we're gonna cover this up. Initially, I was like, what the fuck? Why would you do that? But first of all, power of friendship, to be honest, if that was me and I was Hannah and my bestie has been framed for digging up a grave, I'd be like, oh, you're kind of on your own there. Sorry, like I don't wanna be collateral. I did some research and apparently digging up someone's grave is like 10 years in jail. So I understand why they're like, oh shit, we need to cover this up. Hannah and Aria take the shovel to the woods. They clean off all the prints, bury the shovel. They burn all of Emily's clothes. And then they say that they were at Spencer's lake house. They were not at the lake house, they were at the barn, but they're telling everyone they were out of town at Spencer's lake house. This will unravel later, I think in season four. After they pick up Emily from the cemetery and they're going back to Spencer's house, they see Lucas and he is being shady running around Rosewood at like 3 a.m. Rosewood 3 a.m. challenge, interesting. Could this be who set Emily up? We thought Mona was A and Mona is in Radley. It's true, she is, but there's a new A in town. A big A. That's what we're going to refer to this character as big A. In terms of Mona being at Radley, we find out that Hannah has been going to visit her to work out why she's done all this stuff to her, but Mona doesn't acknowledge her presence and just stares into the wall. This supreme slay and also unhinged girl boss is pretending to not hear anything, but she's actually listening. For what and why? Maybe we will find out soon, maybe we won't. And that's up to Marlene. From the scenes of Hannah visiting Mona at Radley, we also discover that Mona is seeing apparitions of Allison and Allison's always wearing the red coat when Mona sees her. I think it's episode 48 when we get a very memorable quote from Spencer. Spencer is talking about Mona and she says, bitch crazy. What else is going on at this time? Aria's parents are getting divorced. Remember when Mona and Spencer went to the Lost Woods Resort and found A's lair? Well, we find out that Spencer, Hannah, and Aria went back to the lair after Maya's body was found. They didn't want to tell Emily because she was going through it, as we know. They go back to the lair and it's been disassembled. So now Spencer is trying to put the lair back together in like this 3D model on her computer. The disassemblification of A's lair raises the question, who disassembled it? Mona was in Radley, Garrett is in jail. Speaking of Garrett being in prison, Spencer visits him and he says he's innocent and knows a lot of information, including who took Ali's body, but he won't say anything until Spencer's lawyer mother, Veronica, represents him, which will happen in about two episodes time. Emily starts to remember pieces of the night of the grave digging. 
And this entire plot arc is so extremely annoying. The thing that annoys me about it is that there are so many like red herrings and plot holes and just unnecessary additions to it. The first piece of information that Emily remembers is being in the back of a blue car, which Jenna is driving. And we find out Jenna is wearing a red coat. Now, Jenna wearing the red coat has no meaning or value. The fact that Jenna was driving the car is important. The fact that she was wearing red apparently is a coincidence. It's another example of like an unnecessary coincidence that just complicates the plot. At the end of the season three premiere, the girls are sent photos of them at Ellie's dug up grave with a text that says, Mona played with dolls, I play with body parts, game on bitches, dash A. Episode 49, A sends Emily a necklace which says dead girls can't smile with human teeth on it. Slay. This new A is sending literal pieces of human to the girls. After Eminem, Glizzy and Slime Girl find out that Blob has been visiting Mona in Radley, initially they're mad and they're like, wait, hold on, we need you to keep going to work out who this new person is. Garrett tells Spencer that someone she knows has her completely fooled and that people lie but medical records don't. Okay. The way this man starts talking in circles and does not stop for like 12 episodes. Now remember when I said that Emily started to recall that Jenna was driving the car? At this point, they're like, wait, but isn't Jenna Bestie blind? They find out the surgery that she had six months ago in season two actually worked, but she's been telling everyone that it did not work because she is still a target. And at the end of the episode, we have A buying multiple black hoodies, implying a team. The first half of season three, and especially episode 50, has a bunch of Radley scenes. Now Radley, as I said, is Radley Sanitarium, which is like a mental institution. And the way that they frame mental illness in this show, it makes me a bit uncomfortable to be honest. Oh my God, also get this, right? Melissa is back and she's no longer pregnant. It's implied that at some point over the last five months, Melissa has had a miscarriage, but Spencer works out that Melissa is lying and the miscarriage was actually way before she says it was and Melissa has been faking the pregnancy, which means she could be the black swan from the masquerade ball at the end of season two. Boom. Also in episode 50, we get some Jenna flute scenes. Now don't forget Jenna invented the flute. Also Jenna tells the girls that she found Emily walking around that night, referring to the grave digging night, and she tried to take her home, but Emily jumped out of the car at some point. My back is aching, my bra's too tight. Remember how Hannah has been visiting Mona in Radley? Well, suddenly, Ren Kingston, a little doctor sir, is working at Radley Sanitarium, so that's what this line is here. We also find out that Lucas has been visiting Mona. Now, why the fuck would he want to visit Mona? We are actually going to find out. Also, Hannah and Ren kiss. In episode 51, we meet Nate St. Germain. Now, this plot line, when I say these plot lines annoy me, this is the one that annoys me the most. Let me summarize this 12 episode arc in one sentence. Nate St. Germain is not Maya's cousin. He's her stalker, Lyndon James, who killed her and he tries to kill Emily. He also shoots Caleb and he dies because Emily stabs him in self-defense. Give a few seconds to soak that in. Detective Darren Wilden Krusty has been visiting Mona, citing a court order for the De Laurentiis St. Germain murder cases. Melissa tells Spencer she lost the baby when Ian died and that she was blackmailed with the fake pregnancy secret to wear the dress that she was sent and act as a distraction for Jenna at the masquerade ball. Now, why would Mona want Jenna to be distracted? Screaming and crying. We also find out that Veronica Hastings has decided to represent Garrett Reynolds in the De Laurentiis slash St. Germain murder cases because she found out that the list of witnesses includes a private investigator that Peter hired to watch Melissa after Ali's disappearance. Remember the 15K? Emily and Paige are dating. Aria works out the person who took the photos of them at the open grave was Lucas. Emily works out that she was drugged with patient grade sleeping pills from Mona, and that's why she can't remember anything. And Aria discovers those pills in Lucas's camera bag. Boom. So that means Mona gave Lucas the sleeping pills and he took the photos of them at the grave. He also drugged Emily. I feel like that's pretty solid information that Lucas is on the A team. Episode 53. Oh my God, I'm feeling dizzy from this plot line because it's so ridiculous. It makes me so angry that I nearly faint. Emily remembers being with Holden the night of the grave digging. Why? Why fucking Holden? It's never explained. I swear they just chuck like whoever's available on set into these like flashback and dream scenes. There's a plot line where Garrett is allowed out of jail to visit his mother in hospital and he leaves a note that says April Rose has the proof. 
Spencer and Jason follow up the lead and April Rose is the name of an antique store in which they find an anklet that Alison was wearing the night she disappeared, which they give to police and it turns out to have traces of blood on it. Alison's and someone else's, not Garrett's. And now the charges against Garrett have been dropped for this and some other reasons we don't know. Now it's confirmed that Garrett didn't kill either Alison or Maya when Spencer gets a text from A saying, hey Spence, I have one more surprise for you. Garrett isn't their killer. In episode 54, we meet CC Drake. She's introduced as Alison's friend and she formerly dated Jason. Spencer does some digging on Cece and finds out that Cece was prom queen when she was at Rosewood like five years ago. This will become a plot hole later, so feel free to remember that. The way that this character is introduced, I am absolutely convinced that they did not plan for the show to go where it went. Oh my God, it's time to talk about this. All right, so in the same episode, at the end of that episode, we get some iconic PLL bullshit, all right? It's iconic, but it's a mess. Aria and Hannah sneak into Radley to talk to Mona, who has escaped to the children's ward. Of course she has. When they find her, she says, Miss Aria, you're a killer, not Ezra's wife. Where were we? Maya's away sleeping sweet until Garrett's all rosy, count on me. No one to save Ali from evil. No one to save Ali from evil. Now these turn out to be codes. You take the first letter of each word and put them together and it ends up being Maya knew www.masssugar.com and not safe. The website turns out to be Maya's blog where they find info that ends up revealing Nate as her killer. Maya knew. Now what the fuck did Maya know? Just wait till we find out. Oh, hang on. We never find out. Mona is making a point of talking in code so that A doesn't pick up on what she's saying, implying that what she's saying is sensitive to A. But it isn't. Apparently Maya knew is Maya knew that Nate was gonna kill her. That has nothing to do with A. Miss Aria, you're a killer, not Ezra's wife. Bitch, what? It was potentially a perfect setup to make it sound like Maya knew who A was or knew something about big A, but then they just don't take it anywhere. Ranting aside, I know Marlene was proud of herself when she came up with that little code moment. And let me tell you, Marlene, if you're listening and or watching, I enjoyed that shit, I ate it up. First time it came out, I was like, Miss Aria, you're a killer? Does that mean Aria's A? Remember, I was an Aria is A stan, and I was gathering evidence, and that was a giant piece of evidence. What did Maya know? Maya knew that I've got a big fat ass. Sorry. In episode 55, we meet Ezra's mother, Diane, who is a rich old white lady, and she hates Aria because she's underage and poor. Get her ass, Diane, but also come collect your crusty son, Preda Tezra. It turns out Ezra's last name is Fitzgerald and his family is mega rich, but he's distanced himself from them because they're too controlling or something. I don't care. Remember how I mentioned the Ren and Hannah kiss that happens in episode 55, which is like 11 episodes after he kissed Spencer? Get a job, stay away from her. Episode 56. Six, we meet Ezra's brother, Wesley. Wesley lets it slip that Ezra has an ex-girlfriend, Maggie, <laughs> who he got pregnant in high school and Diane paid her off so she would disappear. Aria, girl, get out. Caleb realizes A is back and is clued into what's going on. So now the girls and Caleb know about A. Okay, next thing. This has been going on for a while, but let's make it timeline official now. Ashley is dating Pasta Ted, La Pasta, Lasagna, Lasagna Ted. In episode 57, we find out that Toby has taken a job out of town. This is when Toby joins the A-team to protect Spencer. Oh, hey, oh, hey, oh. Also in episode 57, we have Hannah saying a best friend friend doesn't really date an ex, talking to Ren, referring to Spencer, which is just so bloody ironic when we see what happens in a couple of seasons time. So that's a fun little like bit for you to store away for later. Cece tells Spencer that Allison and Paige used to have beef. So of course Spencer is like, babe, that means Paige is eight. Wrap it up, end the show, we know. There's a flashback to Allison bullying Paige and pretending to be Emily and writing Paige love letters and collecting the letters that Paige sends back and using them as blackmail against her. Paige even considers S-wording. That's how bad the bullying gets. Allison is fucked. Cece is working at a clothing store and Spencer and Hannah are helping her set up an event in the store and we get two gifts from this episode in this instance. The first is this completely random Tresemme product placement where Cece tells Hannah that she needs to use this Tresemme dry shampoo. Not everyone has time to wash their hair. And it's like, what the fuck? The second is Spencer being trapped in a change room with a literal 
snake. But Cece saves her. Thank you, Cece. Slay, slay. <laughs> Slay Slay Drake. Sorry, I've not had any food today. I've only had like a giant coffee. Episode 59, the season three mid-season finale. Wait, I'm gonna put the Alison wig on. Emily tells Paige that A is back. So now the girls, Mona, Caleb and Paige know about this new A and or A team. Paige gets a text from A saying to go to Ali's grave at 10 p.m. or Emily gets hurt, but then Paige gets kidnapped by Nate slash Lyndon and A is apparently not associated with Nate. Mona has escaped Radley by literally walking out the front door. <laughs> And later she's on the phone saying, I understand, implying she's taking orders from Big A. Remember all the shit that I said at the start? That's what happens in this episode. Emily realizes that Nate is Maya's killer. He tries to kill Emily and also kidnaps Paige and tries to kill her. And Tom's house got broken into. Yeah, I'm going through a lot right now. To make a long story short, I shoved a whole bag of jelly beans up my ass. Emily stabs Nate, who shoots Caleb, who has come to save the day. Oh, he passed away? Oh. Mm -hmm. All right. Because Nate confessed to killing Maya, Garrett is officially free, babe. And the girls get a call from A and it's distorted voice. And it says, Emily, I owe you one. Implying that A wanted Garrett out because Garrett is on the A team. That's the implication. But it's actually because A wants to kill Garrett. Ah. Strap in everyone for the next bit. At the end of the episode, we have Mona walking with the black hoodie pal back to Radley. And she says, if I knew Nate was gonna get Garrett out, I would have stayed in tonight. You have to get my cell phone back. Paige doesn't even know she has it. It sucks we didn't get to make that phone call. Ring, ring, what's Paige doing with Maya's cell phone? OMG, she must be the killer. Oh well, even the best laid plans go awry. Wait, I fucking demolished that. And like the whole thing actually makes a lot of sense now because A, Big A, was trying to get Mona to set up Paige as A. Mona is my favorite character. I'm going on record saying that that's my bestie. She did nothing wrong. Now this other A team member that she's talking to turns around and it's Toby Krustvener. I truly remember collapsing on the floor, screaming and crying, throwing up when that little reveal happened. Also, after he turns around, he like runs around the corner, but it's like the weirdest fucking run I've ever seen. And look, even though I hate that Maya was killed in the first place and killed by some random Krusty who appears for 12 episodes of season three, this episode was fucking fantastic. It's one of the best episodes of the series. It's also one of the highest rated. It's just like the girls did a good job. Alrighty, we have made it. The final episode that I will be covering in this video is episode 60 or episode 13 of season three, AKA the season three Halloween episode. The episode's called This Is A Dark Ride and it takes place on a train. This is such a great episode. This is one of my favorites of the entire series. There's iconic outfits, campy action and major, major plot developments. Okay, so we start the episode with Mona and Radley handing an A-team member three pills and four bullets. When Mona's up to some shit, you know it's gonna be good. So Rosewood's 2011 Halloween moment is the Halloween train. And when I say Halloween train, it's like a costume party on a train and it's also like all ages, I'm pretty sure. Ezra tells Arya that he can't go because he has a job interview as the flop manager at Flop Enterprises, like I give a shit. Emily demolishes the runway in this Barbarella sleigh. Actually, Hannah really did too. And let's be real, Spencer ate too and Arya was there. While this is all happening, Ashley, Ashley babe, and Ted are administering candy, administering, why did I write administering? Are giving candy to the tots, babe. And there's a terrible plot line of Ashley seeing a ghosty girl that appears and has an evil twin, but it's implied it wasn't a ghost. But also it's like, so is this show paranormal or not? Oh my God, more on that later, season four. Oh, Ravenswood, oh. Plus points to the PLL team for the Halloween episode. Negative points for the random paranormal child. We also find out that Mona has escaped Radley, which implies she's on the train somewhere. Back on the train, we have Adam Lambert. <laughs> yes, that is correct. Adam Lambert is on this episode of Pretty Little Lies. He's singing on the train. He's giving the girls a tune. So Adam's performing on the train and he later talks to Aria who is moping because Ezra Flop couldn't make it on the train. Adam asks her her name, but the train is too loud because it's going in a tunnel, babe. So she spells it on the window. A-R-I-A. You're watching Disney Channel. After Adam leaves and Arya is looking out the window, someone in a Queen of Hearts costume opens their ring and puts white powder in Arya's drink. This girl is about to be knocked out. Oh bitch, then we get a big revelation. Garrett is on the train. 
and he tells Spencer a massive piece of information from the night Allison disappeared. All right, strap in everyone. After they were in Allison's room, Garrett and Jenna confront Allison in her backyard. Allison and Jenna start having a literal fight babe, like punches. And Allison literally knocks a blind girl to the floor, fucking menace. And Jenna tells Garrett to do something. Garrett takes Spencer's hockey stick. Remember the fucking hockey stick? Yeah, she's back. Garrett takes the hockey stick and swings on Allison, but deliberately hits the tree behind her over and over again while Allison is doing the shh. So now Jenna thinks that Garrett just killed Allison, but Allison is actually still alive. But bitch, Garrett is not done spilling the tea. Garrett tells Spencer that later that night he saw Allison talking to Byron. Dun, dun, dun. And he sees Allison say to Byron, you know what I'm capable of, bruh. All right, back on the train a little bit later in real time. The girls are looking for Aria cause she's gone. And the Aria on the window has been wiped and now it just says A. Implies that whoever's queen of hearts is A. So much drama. Aria has been put in a crate with her mouth and hands tied and she's in the crate next to Garrett's dead body. Bitch. So what we've got here so far, everyone, A has killed Garrett and drugged Aria and put her in this box. <laughs> <laughs> While this is happening, Hannah is trying to talk to Caleb, who's in a Phantom of the Opera outfit and mask, but it's not him. She takes off the Phantom of the Opera mask to reveal someone in a fucking Alison De Laurentiis mask and a blonde wig, much like my blonde wig. Maybe it was me. We find out at the end of this episode that the person in the mask in the mask was Mona. The actual fucking collapse. Ooh. While this is happening, the Queen of Hearts tries to kill Spencer by throwing her off the train and who saves her? Paige. Back in the box, okay, Aria has found a nail and a screwdriver and is cutting the tape on her hands when the box lifts and she can hear two people, a man and a woman, trying to push the crate off the fucking train, okay? She shoves the screwdriver through the crate and stabs one of the people. They run off and the girls arrive and save Aria. Later on, the police are on the train questioning everyone about Garrett's death and then crusty fucking Ezra arrives and he says he came when he heard there was drama on the train, babe, I don't believe you. And and then Toby and Noel are fighting and knock the drinks cooler, which has Allison's fucking missing body bag from her grave. Let me just... What? Oh my God, truly one of the best episodes of television ever. And then I'm not even done because at the end of the episode, there's a flashback to where Allison was buried and a hand comes out of the ground and it's wearing Allison's bracelet from season one discourse. Oh my God. End of season three A. We've got a PowerPoint in the middle of the display. Delicious. We have red indicating season one, green indicating season two, blue indicating season three A. We have the day Alison disappeared. We have five dead characters, Alison de Laurentiis, Ian Thomas, Garrett Reynolds, Maya St. Germain, and Nate St. Germain forward slash Lyndon James. We have Mona, who is A confirmed. We have Lucas, who was on the A team. We have Toby, who's on the A team. And we have Big A, who we don't know who that is yet. We have Melissa, Hastings as the black swan and we have the queen of hearts who we don't know who that is yet We also have Kim Lip from Luna. Did anyone spot that? I put that there as a little treat. That brings me to the end of this discussion. That was the first 60 episodes of the show Pretty Little Liars, two and a half seasons. If this video does well and people enjoy it, then I will do the second part with the rest of season three, four and five, but I'm only gonna do it if you enjoy it because it's a lot of work otherwise. So if you did enjoy this video, make sure you let me know by liking it and leaving me a comment and babe, share it around, share the love, share the antics. If you thought this was wild, season four and five are just like, they just be doing anything. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. I actually had so much fucking fun. Thank you so much for watching. I'm gonna go scream into the abyss while I edit this. Don't forget to slay and I'll talk to you all soon. Peace out, bye. You know you wanna kiss me. I know you wanna kiss me.